repeat the top with me, please. Say courageously, courageously fighting, fighting by taking up your cross. Every now and then in life, people lose their fight. There's no drive, there's no motivation, there's no passion. You, you can't live without running out of gas. If you drive far enough, at some point you have to pull in the gas station and recharge. If you don't, eventually you just <laughs> run out of gas. This sermon is about you and whether or not you have run out of gas, run out of fight, run out of passion. There's no burning drive in you anymore. You're not really sure what you're doing. And what's really sad is you're waiting for somebody to help you figure it out as if someone's job is to fix you. So you get you a man, get you a woman, get you some new house, some new thing. And what you discover once you get the new man, the new house, the new stuff, the new woman, whatever it is you think you need, then you find yourself, if you're not careful, running up on the same issues. Because life is about fighting forward. Life is about renewal. It's about becoming uh, that rookie again who doesn't know everything and then you have to fight your way forward. Life is not about arriving one day and never having to try again. It's not about getting a certain amount of money and you never have to think about money ever in your life again. One of my wealthy friends told me, he said, you don't really have a challenge until you run out of money. It's when you have no financial challenges that you're not doing anything. You should always be pushing yourself forward, striving to do better, striving to learn and grow. It's not about greed. It's about advancement. Have you lost your fight? Have you lost your passion? Have you given up on everything? And you're waiting around for maybe this sermon to fix everything. I hope it inspires you, but listen to me. This sermon is only a part of the puzzle. The biggest part of it is in you. That's why last week we talked about the greatest challenge you're going to have is dealing with you, fighting yourself. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus made a statement to, to the disciples that was really important. In verse 24, he said, if, you, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Those three things are important. He said, if you ever want to get anywhere with me. First of all, you have to fight yourself, deny yourself. Secondly, you've got to learn how to take up a cross. You have to carry something that's hard to carry. And thirdly, you have to learn how to follow. Those three elements are important. And this month, we're talking about that. People who fight with those three things in mind will do better. <coughs> the first person I fight is not you. It's not the deacons or the elders or anybody. It's me denying myself, saying no to me. I'm not doing that. I am not doing that. I refuse to think that way. That's where the fight starts. Peter didn't understand that. Peter thought any kind of difficulty beyond a certain point was unreasonable. Now, I want you to look at me, what he, look, he told Peter, and I'm under number one in your notes there. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, Peter struggles with the price tag for being a follower. Here's what he said. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must go to Jerusalem. Mandatory that he go to Jerusalem and suffer how many things? Many, many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And then he just threw this in and be killed. Now, for Peter, that's a hard conversation. You're just talking about being killed. You talk about suffering. And then he goes on to say, not only be, be killed, but be raised the third day. That's encouraging. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Verse 23. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Now, this is a strong moment of conversation, but the goal is, I need to teach you something, Peter. Life is not going to always just come to you. There is a fight element involved in it. And you're going to have to learn how to do three things if you want to follow me. And it starts with you denying yourself, fighting you, fighting this temptation you have, Peter, to want everything to be easy. It is a common Christian attitude. It's in our music. Every song. I'm not against the encouraging songs. I'm not against it. I'm not saying be gloomy and doomy. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of our music is gloomy and doomy. It's like every, everything is about how sad I am and help me God and pull me up. I'm dying. Oh, Jesus. Sometimes I can't listen to it because I'm happier than the song. That's just me, okay? But I think sometimes in life, you have to develop a real understanding of how life works. And he says, Peter, that you're wrong, Peter. 
You're talking like a man, not like God. You need to understand there's a fight element in this. You will not raise kids without a fight. You will not be successful in any vocation without a fight. There's an element of fighting in everything, and our church has embraced that idea. We're fighting it now. Things have changed, and I think we're fighting well. God's helping us. We fight. We, we, we understand. I think we're down 15% in the building overall, about 1,000 a weekend come here. And about, but but uh, we're up 34% online. A thousand at home watching it now. Everybody say amen. amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap. God is good. <laughs> Our income is up 10%. We're going in the right direction. Here's the deal. That, that can't happen if you're not willing to fight a new way. You got one fight in your mind, one way you do everything, one way, one way, one way. Our outside events are up. 8,700 last year, people came to our special events outside of the building. Yay, thank you, Jesus. This year to be closer to nine. I love that. I love the fact that God's doing amazing things, but he's doing it different ways. You want to fight, but you want to fight the same way you fought last time. And you can't adjust. You can't shift. We used to do television one way, 30-minute program. Now we did one a little minute, 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 motivational, motivational moments, they're called. A million-plus people. Can we say amen to that? And Come on, amen. Come on, amen. It's amazing. It's all, about, it's all about saying, okay, the way I raise my kids is not the way I can raise my grandkids. The way I worked last year, I can't work that way this year. I have to evolve and change. And that's hard work. There's a fight in that. Fighting schedule, fighting fatigue, fighting, here's a big one, bad habits. I'll talk about that in January. It's, it's amazing how a lot of what we want to do, cut new paths, light new ways, all that's not possible because of our habits. God's trying to help us get to a place. But we can't get there. Matter of fact, let me say it to you, you'll never get there. Not without fighting first. And so that's the message to Peter, and that's the message to us today. And so today, I want to take you to the second step. In fighting, you must first fight yourself, and the second thing you must learn to do is, he says, you must learn how to carry a cross. Now, and I call this crosses challenges that are unfair. That's what I call them. Because the cross was unfair to Jesus. It was unfair. He didn't deserve to die. He died for us. And here's what I believe he's saying to us. There's just something that's really simple and profound. If you're going to follow me, there are going to be unfair moments in your life when you have to manage something that's difficult that you didn't create. Look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 53, verse 5. Christ was unfairly wounded for us, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon who? Him. And, and by stripes, we, we, are, we are healed. Notice in ver- Hebrews 12 and 2. Christ was shamed for us, looking unto Jesus, the author, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the what? Cross. He endured the cross. It wasn't fun. He endured the cross. Like you endure marriage, you endure family, you endure job, you endure stuff. Anybody know about anything about enduring? It's enduring. We endure the process. Enduring the cross, despising the what? Shame. It's shameful. You feel embarrassed. There are parts of it. Carrying a cross is shameful. Going up a hill with a cross on your back, people yelling at you, blaming you for stuff you didn't do, despising the shame. But now, of course, he sat down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. That, my friend, is what bearing a cross is like. It's unfair, an unfair responsibility. Those are not your children. You raised yours. Now you're the grandparent doing more than you ever thought you'd have to do. It's unfair. But it is part of being a grandparent. It's part of the life. You have to help in places you never planned to help. You're on a job and they've, they've, they've let go of most of the people and you're carrying a bigger load than is fair. And no one's saying it's not fair. You're working more hours than you should. That's true. But that sometimes is part of the process. And, and Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, deal with yourself first. Say no to you. Self-denial. Fight yourself. Secondly, learn how to carry a cross. And let me give you a list of them. Right? Seven types of unfair responsibilities or crosses that people are forced to carry. You ready? No. Repeat them with me, please. Say family crosses, family crosses. Physical, crosses. physical crosses, emotional crosses, emotional crosses. academic crosses, academic. Relationship, crosses. relationship crosses, prison crosses, prison crosses. Prison crosses. Re- religious, crosses. religious crosses. You ever go to a church and you see 
you, you know, you gave it your best, and then, and then you got there, and the leader failed. Something happened. And, you know, and you're exposed to this painful process of religious disappointment. Have you ever seen somebody be accused of something and went to jail and they didn't do it? Or maybe, you know, I know some people who didn't do it, really, but they were around people who did it. But they've got the stain on them because they were just around them. Got arrested in a whole bit. There are people who carry a mark that isn't true in your family. You're blamed for something. You, didn't, you really didn't do it. You did some other things, but you didn't do that. <laughs> Relationship crosses, friends who betrayed you in, dis, in, in, a, in disappointing ways. That is hard. It's hard to fall in love and have to live with the death of the, of the relationship. It, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a funeral that stays in your mind over and over again. How did, we, how did we get to that place? Start off in love and had this great romantic moment, and then all of a sudden, this friendship, this relationship, whatever it was, just fell completely apart. What about your academic cross? People who <laughs> were not properly prepared. They went to school to learn, but then all of a sudden now, they are failing. And, and the reason they're failing is because they didn't have the right foundation. A lot of our kids in school. A lot of young boys are discouraged at school only because they can't read at the level they need to to be successful. Who wants to fail? People say things like, school's not for me, college is not for me. Oftentimes, that's a foundational issue. With a little coaching, a little help, they could do better. If they figured out how their brain works, not everybody in the class, how my brain works, you could be more successful. But because there's not that kind of support system sometimes, everybody doesn't have the same support system. I knew right away when I, when I'm, when I, when I married Diane and, and I saw her do homework, I knew I was dealing with a kung fu master. <laughs> it was no question. This girl knew exactly where to start. She taught kids. She taught high school. She taught, she taught, she taught elementary school. She taught people how to learn to read. She from the um, gate. I mean, kinder, she knew all of it. She just knew what to do. You know, and there's, there's something about Understanding that there are people carrying an academic cross that they didn't necessarily create. Now, I know everybody can't blame you, and they can't blame everybody for your issues, but if you're really honest, a lot of times in our society, we push kids along, and then they struggle up, the, up, up down the river. When you get to that freshman year, and you just can't get there, or that senior in high school, and you just can't get it, and, you're, and you feel like you're dumb. You're not dumb. Your foundation's a problem. Your foundation's an issue. There are a lot of preachers that want to preach, and then when they get up here after a while, it becomes academic. Past one or two sermons. Now you have to kind of like really study for real. And now if you're not careful, you'll loop every week and say the same thing. There's an academic side to it, and if you're not careful, you get stale. And you lose fire. And it becomes a cross. Just the academic side of your life becomes difficult. So I really believe it's important to keep pushing yourself, to learn, to read, to grow, so that you can handle the, the dynamics of your life as it changes. And then there is an emotional cross, people who have been abused. Somebody did something to you, and it stays in your mind all the time. It's what he said to you. It's what she said to you. I listen to it often. Sometimes it's a physical cross. You've got an illness. Or maybe somebody assaulted you. Somebody hurt you physically. And you look at that scar every day. There's something about those crosses that are difficult, but none can be as heavy sometimes as the family crosses. What happened to my family is a big question. How in the world did we get to this place? How did our family become a place where everything is out of control? For you, some of you, it's a single parent home. How did you get to be single and you're carrying all this load? And all of these are crosses, but listen to me carefully. These are your crosses. Not mine. These are yours. And here's what Jesus said. If you're going to follow me, here's the key factor. You've got to fight yourself and you've got to learn how to carry your cross. And there's a way you carry it. And he gives us an example in the story. There's a way you manage the difficulties in your life. Now, I want you to hear this for a second, and you got to get this right, okay? This is, this is important for you. This is your cross, not mine. 
you, and I like counseling. I believe in going to counseling. But here's what happens in counseling. Counselors show you how to carry your cross. When you're finished, that's what's going to happen. You're going to come out of the counselor's office with some tools. But the counselor can't take it from you. And, and Christians, I, I was laughing. I don't know why it came to me this way. The other day I was in the car and I thought about, you know, okay, we have this, um, I don't know, I guess we run out of gas in our, our Christian spiritual life real fast. So Sunday services now, right? Then you got to have a Tuesday night prayer meeting because you ran out by Tuesday. <laughs> then you got to have a Wednesday night Bible study because you're out by Wednesday, you know. And then Friday night evangelistic service. Then you got to, you know what I'm saying? It's like you got to live in church. Because you're always out of gas. Now, here's what's happening. If you're not careful, you're trying to find a way to get somebody, some preacher, some worship leader to carry your cross. When you leave church, you're still married to the same person. Can I get an amen? amen. You still have the same children. Here's what you've got to learn, how to manage those things. I want you to come to church, but I can't make this the place you hide. You have to find a way to manage your life. And listen, you've got to manage it alone, by yourself. There's an element to this job, this Ricky Temple's issue by himself. Nobody can help me with this. There's some things that are just part of my life, and here's some things you can do to manage the unfair crosses you, you carry. Matthew 16, verse 21. Watch this. First of all, embrace them with vision and confidence. Say that with me, please. Come on. Embrace them with vision and confidence. You've got to put your arm around it. I love verse 21. Watch what he said. He said, you know, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go. Must go to Jerusalem. And he must suffer many things from the elders. And he must be killed. I've got to embrace this. This is the declaration of embracing. This son of mine is going to be like this for another five years. Put your arm around it. This is not a temporary trial. This is not. This is not. This boy is not going to finish school. He's going to have to get a GED. This is not. Put your arm around the GED. Put your arm around the truth. Jesus said embrace it. I've got to deal with this. Like Peter, and Peter didn't like it, but he says put your arm around it, Peter. And if, if you don't, you frustrate yourself. Secondly, he said, watch this now. <laughs> this is just part of my journey. I've got to go to Jerusalem. That's where they want to hurt me, but that's where I've got to go. Put my arm around it, and then I've got to secondly watch this. Know that this is part of my journey. This is part of my journey, my journey. I can't run from that. Thirdly, I've got, got to see them as short-term distractions. I love this part. He says, my third day is coming, guys. He said, I'm going to be raised after I'm killed on the third day. Can you say this to me, please? Say, my third day, my third day is, coming. is coming. It's always come, right? Your third day has always come, right? You've always, you, no matter what you've gone through in the past, you've always made, look, you're here today. Can you at least say this with you? Please say, I made, it. I made it. You made it. You're here. You made it. You made it this far. You thought that after whatever happened to you happened, you wouldn't make it, but you made it past whatever happened to you. My third day always comes. But what's key to making it all work is who I follow. You know, when Jesus ended this conversation with Peter, the, the thing that he wanted Peter to think about was you're not following now. You're leading. You're telling me this is not going to happen to me, and I'm telling you you're wrong. I want you to be clear. Your biggest problem, Peter, is self-denial. You, you, you have to learn to fight yourself. Secondly, Peter, you've got to learn how to carry a cross right. Some things are not going to be easy, and you've got to put your arm around it. You're in school. It's not easy. Put your arm around it. It's not simple. The study habits, the, the responsibilities. Are, you're, you're a manager. You own a company. Put your arm around it. There are certain things that you have to put your arm around. For me, it was really amazing. Do you know one of the things that I put my arm around? That every week I get up in front of people several times a week. I just think it's hilarious. Never thought I wanted to do this ever in my life, but I have to put my arm around it. That's your cross, temple. That's your responsibility. That's your job. 
That's, that's your place. Put your arm around being a mama. Put your arm around it. That's what you do. And then here's the last thing, Peter. He said, listen, you got to learn how to follow. In this country, we're really big on leadership, not followership. There is a need for you to Google that word and buy books on it. I'm going to give you a couple of books today on followership. Next week, I'm going to pick up on this theme, and I want you to hear me. If you're ever going to go way down the road, you have to learn how to follow somebody. And I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, some people, you know, they, they really just kind of focus on that because they want everybody to follow them. I don't know that that's the point about following, a, you know, I think you should have somebody in mind. I think that's fine. But, but more, than, more than somebody in mind, have a followership attitude so that when someone needs to guide you, you can, you can be guided. You know, I'm, I don't know that there's one individual in the world that would be doing all the leading for you. But there needs to be in you the willingness to say, I don't know everything. I'm open to learning. And I'm not, I'm not against being shown if I'm wrong. It's okay for me to follow. And I, I want to I read a couple of things to you. And I'll give you a couple of books to read and a couple of things that we'll talk about more next week. We live in a culture, think about this now, of people who oftentimes from their youth, from their youth now, have not really followed anyone without resistance. From our youth, it's been a long time. I want you to think about who are the people you followed? Has it been since you were a teenager that you haven't followed anybody at all? Our confidence in church leaders, political leaders, and corporate leaders is at an all-time low. The tragedy is that we have developed an anti-follower approach to life. It's hard to be a good leader if you have never been a good what? Follower. In our country, we like leadership more than followership. In Scripture and in many countries around the world, the emphasis is on followership. In the book Discovering Followership, Learn the Secrets of Walking Behind and Staying Ahead, the author said this, followership is perceived as a forced condition of servitude that impedes individuality and results in the loss of identity of the, follow, of the person following. However, nothing could be further from the truth. True followership is actually a tool of empowerment and a launching pad for the release of a follower's individuality and potential. It's when you learn to follow, it's when you understand that this is not a bad thing, that God is trying to set me up for a better life if I take on the Spirit. Finally, there's a book called The Leadership Principle, Nobody is Talking About, by Tracy Armstrong. And in this book, there's a tremendous statement made about Michael Jordan that I thought was profound. When the Chicago Bulls basketball team regularly won championships, the, the coach, Phil Jackson, was asked, what is the key? Michael Jordan, right? Yes. <laughs> but not for the reasons you may think, he replied. Not the scoring, the reporter said. Asked, no, said Coach Jackson. Not for, not for playmaking, no. It must be for his defense, no. Jackson responded to the reporter. He was my coach on the floor. He executed my direction, the game plan, the way I wanted the team to play. He was the role model, the prototype player. And he ensured the rest of the team modeled what I expected. Watch that now. He worked relentlessly. He made sure he was the coach on the floor. He executed my directions, the game play plan that, that I wanted the team to play. He was the role model, the prototype player, and he ensured that the rest of the team modeled what I expected. He worked relentlessly to learn and elevate his play. He set an example for the team, being the last that left the floor in the free throw practice and the first and last in and out of the weight room. He was a follower. That's what made him great. A lot of NBA players can learn from that. It's not always about being in charge. You're praying for God to do something in your life, but he says, you know, the problem is I can't send anybody to show you the way. Because everybody you meet, you want to lead. I, I want to I get you to a better place, but... Your definition of fighting is you get in the ring and you coach yourself. You're coaching yourself through all your life issues. 
You're your only voice. You're almost like God to yourself. Who can lead you? Okay, so you won't deny yourself much, okay? You complain about every cross you have all the time to everybody that will listen, and you won't follow anybody. How is this going to work out? I have a new term that I use called prophetic predictor. Can you say that with me, please? Come on. Here's what that means. I can look at your habits. I can look at your life and say, you don't deny yourself much. You're not very disciplined, self-disciplined. You like to talk about everybody else's discipline issues, okay? You you complain about every cross and issue, okay? And you won't follow anybody. Here's a prophetic prediction. You will never get to where you want to be or could be. Some things you don't need God to show you. You can just look at the choices they make. But when I look at my life, here's the question. What do I see? That's what this sermon's made me do. It's made me step back and look at myself. And I don't need an angel to come and tell me. I don't need anybody. I can just look at me and say, I am not willing to fight me. I'm not willing to deal with me, my tongue, my attitude, my approach to people. I am not willing to put my arms around my responsibilities, fair or unfair. And because of that, it's going to be very difficult for God to get to me. Do you know anybody like this? Do you know anybody that you look at and you, you, you with great love say, I wish I could help you. I wish I had the opportunity to show you a better way. But you can. You've had employees work for you and you've had to. You saw them self-destruct. You saw it coming. You saw it coming. You have family members. You've seen them kill themselves slowly. And it's painful to watch the movie. But here's what's more painful. To watch yourself go down this road and not stop yourself. My prayer as a church is that we would challenge ourselves to go down the road in the right direction. A friend said something the other day. It was really touching. He said, all my young people left my church years ago. I thought, really? Did you chase them? Did you, did you change the system? Great person, but when he said that to me, I was like, really? Your marriage is ending, you see it, right? Your health is going down, right? You know how you know, oh, they you go. can't have that in a while. What is that? Oh, there's a new one. Oh, boy. And, and you know, and as you get older, it's, it's evangelistic pain. <laughs> it, goes, it goes from one side to the other. And you've just ignored it. You refuse, you refuse, you refuse. Father, help us today. In this moment, pick up our gloves and fight. Fight off the temptation to surrender to this. I declare in Jesus' name that when we leave this room, Something will be ignited in our hearts and in our minds as we leave this moment. Those who are watching from home or in their office or on the job, wherever they're watching or on demand, God, we pray in Jesus' name that a fight would rise in their hearts and a passion to not surrender. God, I, I, I rebuke that temptation to live in the state of defeat. I am committed in Jesus' name open my heart to you to touch me and show me how show me how to move forward can you lift your hands with me please God we lift our hands and surrender to you we're not just here to hear some religious word we're here to get a map to a new new beginning for our lives you died on the cross to set us free you died on the cross to give us a new life you did not die on the cross for us to die before we should die you, didn't, you, you came to give us life. And the Bible says life more abundantly. And so I rebuke this depressive spirit. I declare over us, oh God, a healthy, happy, passionate life. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Come on, amen. A passionate, strong, inspired life.
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Look at me for a second. I am going through something right now in my life. This is amazing. I'm not quite sure what it is. <clears throat> On one side, I'm excited. I am truly excited. I can give you a list of exciting things. But on the other side, there's a hesitation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's that thing that's like, mm, I don't know if I want to do all that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This? Mm, I don't know. I need to think about that again. I don't know. I need to pray about that. I, you know, mercy. One side. Excited out of my mind. On the other side, I'm struggling a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Some of you, you, you dating somebody. You excited about marriage, but on the other side, you say, I don't know if I want that in my life again, Jesus. One woman just told me, I love the comment, just, just, just bless me. I just don't know, Pastor Rick. Something about that moment. That's the fight. I'm in the middle of it right now. And I have to talk to myself. It goes like this. Come on, Tim. Now, you need to come on now. You need to come on now. I just got through. We rented a house. You know, we had an old Thanksgiving. We rented a house down in Florida. And, you know, but here's, here's what's interesting. When you rent the house, you always got to leave. I had to pack up my stuff. And you know, when you rent those houses down there, they, 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 um, they, they tell you to be out by 10. They're outside the door at 9.59. They mean out by 10. So I was loading up my car, and the people next to us in the house next to us loading up their car. And I, I said, yeah, you know it's not yours when you got to leave. And they laughed, and I laughed, and I drove off. And I got up this morning in my own house. And I said, I ain't got to leave here. Come on, say amen. This is my house. Praise God. I can, I can stay here. Nobody going to check me out at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Hotel, same way. 11, 12, 12. Can I have a uh, late checkout? Sometimes they say yes. Sometimes they say no. You got to go. On time. We got people waiting for your room. You got to fight. That struggle is not abnormal. But the difference between you and a loser is the fight. The difference between you and somebody in your family is the fight. The difference between the temples and the name of the family is the fight. It's whether I'm willing to fight, whether I'm willing to get in the valley of the shadow of death and fight with my kids. Am I willing to fight? It may be a struggle. But that's what fighting is about. It is about the struggle. I can get up here and you can think my life is perfect. It's not perfect. I got some, I got some fancy footwork I'm about to do. Yes, I am. I'm about to do. I, have, I mean, I can name it. I got some financial fancy footwork. I got some goals. I've set some dates. I am, I am aiming in a direction. I, am, I'm, I'm, I have some physical goals. I am determined in Jesus' name. I am determined. I am de four days this week. Come on, say amen. I got in there four days. I'm determined. I will not allow this to happen to me. Now, I'm telling you, until you get that kind of fight, do you feel it every day? No, but I'm fighting anyway because I'm not letting that happen to me. In the name of Jesus, my whole body will be in alignment with God's will. I will not let it happen to me. The devil is a liar. I refuse that. I'm saying no to that. And I'm telling you, it's not going to change until you decide to fight. You can pray all you want to. You can get on the altar and cry until you, until you run out of tears and everything else, all the other fluids. You can let them all flow. It doesn't matter. You will be the same place when you get up if you don't fight. No, I, I got to go. I'm done. Good time, Pastor. Father, we lift our hands, we lift our hearts, and we lift our fight. We're going to courageously fight, and we're going to fight in faith. In our next series, we're going to talk about courageous faith. We believe it's God's will for us to follow him in faith. And so we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.
Now, with every head bowed, every hand down for a minute, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, after hearing today's message, my fight is I have been resisting and I struggle with my walk with God. You know, the, this idea that I need to give my life to God and all that. What does that mean? Does it mean I'm like perfect overnight? No, it just means I acknowledge I need to start in a new place. That my walk with God has not been what it should be. That I'm not really serving God for real and I need to be real. Uh, whatever other people are doing, I can't worry about that. But for me, I need to be real. So if you're here today and you just want me to pray for you because you want to start a genuine walk with God, whether you're here or home, wherever you are, I see a hand. Anybody else? Just raise your hand. I want to know who I'm praying for. Just raise your hand. I want to see who I have. One, two, three, four. Do I see four? Five. Do I see anybody else? I see six. I see anybody else. Just raise your hand. Put them back down. That would be great. Father, I pray for these plus the others who raise their hearts. I pray in Jesus' name for those who are home watching, those who are on demand watching. Let this be the moment that they say, I need to start a walk with God. And I need, a, I need, I need to, to embrace the fight. It may mean a few bruises, but I know that my life needs to go in another direction. So I thank you and I praise you for your forgiveness, for Jesus who died on the cross, for my new life, to give me a chance to start again. So in Jesus' name, this is my new day. Let the church say amen.